We know that truth is more powerful than death, and persecution only scatters the seeds of truth. Huss's courage, his resolve, it's astounding to die rather than compromise his convictions, inspired countless others to follow uh, in his footsteps. Well, we welcome you today to this very, very special uh, series of podcasts with Dr. Jason Hubbard, Presbyterian minister who's based in Whatcom County, about, what, 100 k's north of Seattle, uh, 60, 60 miles north of Seattle, not too far from the Canadian border in the uh, northwestern corner of the USA. He's a man of prayer. He's been running a 24-7 prayer house for well, for well over a decade now. And he's also the director for the International Prayer Council, which are raising up a team of wonderful people from around the globe who are raising up prayer for missions and for the move of the spirit. And both of us share a very deep love for the Moravians. So Jason is going to write a book Yes, he's going to write a book, and he's using these podcasts as a, as a foundation for that book, as an insight into the Moravians. And the book is called The Moravians, A Hundred Year Prayer Meeting That Changed the World. Both of us are convinced that these guys really did that. And it's not well known, it's not well documented, and it is very much the hidden seed, as you'll find out. It's very much a hidden story. I didn't even know about the Moravians in detail till I read this book in um, uh, 1994, and I felt cheated, Jason. I thought, how come no one has told me about what these Moravians have done? How did you feel about when you first heard about the Moravians? Oh yeah, I was so inspired. Uh, I had studied church history, uh, got my master's in church history, and um, we spent a little bit of time uh, thinking and talking about the Moravians, but when I actually started to study the history of the movement, it was astounding. I was like, how come no one ever told me this before? <laughs> you felt the same way as I did, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, why hadn't, why hadn't they told us? Can you tell me why don't more people know about the Moravians? I think, by the way, the word is getting out. I, there's a lot more books about them in the last 20, 25 years. But the book that I read was like 30 years old, and at the time I couldn't find very much else about them. Is that right? Am I wrong? Sure. Yeah, I think that's correct. Uh, there hasn't been a lot written, not a lot of scholarship. I mean, I think, you know, with the Reformation time frame, the Counter-Reformation, this story kind of got, um, I don't know. Buried. It just kind of bypassed over. I think part of it, though, too, is that they were such a hidden community and, and humble community that that's part of their story. What makes it so fascinating to me is that God uses simple people uh, to do an astounding work. So I think it's the Lord's timing to really uncover so much of what they've done. And there's been so many that have been inspired, especially in the prayer movements, missions movements by the Moravian story. Look, I know we're going to go into detail a bit later on, but let's just talk about in this introduction, uh, you know, the overall impact of the Moravians um, and the timeline, you know, of from what you the way you see read the play. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's just an amazing story, uh, the story of Count Zinzendorf, the Moravians. I think it's one of the truly one of the greatest in church history where God used these humble, simple believers to launch the first Protestant 24-7 prayer with worship movements and the first Protestant missionary movements, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. I believe Count Zinzendorf and the Moravian community are great models for us today to learn from, where we can grow together, servant leaders and Christ-exalting, spirit-led, Bible-based, uh, gospel-dominated, disciple-making, love-saturated leadership uh, where we're following the Lamb wherever He goes in these days. Uh, it's interesting, this year marks the 300-year anniversary of the founding of Herrnhut, 
when Christian David, one of their key leaders, fell the first tree for the first home on June 17th of 1722. And he had dedicated this small community to the Lord. He was praying from Psalm 84, uh, verses 3 and 4. It says, Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. It goes on and says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. And indeed, the Moravian people, this community would eventually become a dwelling place for the Lord, an altar for the presence of the Lord. I mean, fantastic. Uh, so many throughout church history have been inspired by this. And in particular, the title of this book, The Moravian, A Hundred Years of Prayer. A dedication to missions and, of course, the wholehearted love for Jesus Christ, their Savior. Um, so the founding in 1722, June 17th, and then uh, they experienced a visitation of the Holy Spirit, powerful visitation. They called it a baptism of love, a Moravian Pentecost, on August 13th, 1727. So this is five years after the founding. And this happened and occurred during a communion service. It was a baptism of love where God's love was shed abroad in their hearts and poured out in love for one another. And then following this, the Holy Spirit compelled them to build a canopy of united and strategic and sustainable prayer that continued for a hundred plus years. They prayed night and day, including men, women, and children, and under this canopy of prayer, then God began to mark missionaries and send them to the nations of the earth. Uh, we know of 200 plus missionaries that responded and they helped to establish over 5,000 missionary settlements around the world. These settlements had day and night prayer. They served the community. How many uh, settlements again, uh, Jason? Uh, this was 5,000 that we know of. Um, uh, missionary settlements around the world. 5,000 missionary settlements, would they themselves establish 24-7 prayer as well? Yeah, correct, yeah. And not all these had full 24 hours a day, but it was always their vision to call the people to continual prayer. This 100 years of prayer was, and we'll get into this more later, but uh, they called it hourly intercession. So each person or each family, they would commit to an hour of prayer each day. And on that hour, they would pray for the community. They would pray scripture. Uh, they would pray over a watchword that they sensed was from the Lord for that week. And they would pray for missionaries and for evangelism and pray for the lost around the world. Uh, and really what I think, you know, the heart of this community, what compelled them or what motivated them to pray night and day and to go on gospel mission was the absolute worth of Jesus. Right? Their purpose and mandate, the, the Moravian watchword was this, to win for the lamb who was slain the due reward for his sufferings. They would cry out, our lamb has conquered, let us follow him. And a theme verse for them, Revelation 5.12 Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might and honor and glory and blessing. Amen and amen. Apparently, Zinzendorf, they're very Christ-centered, as you said, very biblical. Um, I mean, they, they came from a pietist slash Lutheran sort of background with, you know, the, the Catholics and all the other sort of um, different movements thrown in, the, you know, the... Uh, Anabaptists, etc., etc., but they had a very biblical foundation, but very Christ centered. Mm -hmm. So they were working to bring a reward to Jesus. Yeah. A reward to Jesus. And that reward was souls yeah. for people coming to Christ. So they were, they were incredibly Christ centered, Bible based, but they had a passion like. Un, unworthy, un, un, sort of und, indefatigable passion for the gospel, didn't they? Yeah, amen. Yeah, because of the sacrifice of Christ at the cross, 
the, you know, it's, it's his willingness to give his life. And this course is the greatest place of love in all of human history. It was because of his sacrifice that we declare, Jesus, you are worthy. And when Zinzendorf used that word, worth, he was thinking about him being all deserving of all the worship, uh, all the obedience, and all the affections of a human race. If there were those that didn't know him, uh, it, would, it would behoove us to share this great good news with them. Uh, that they would have an opportunity to give their hearts and their lives to the Lord Jesus, to follow him as the Lamb. Now, we are going to go on a later stage to talk about in detail the Moravian Mission Movement, so we don't want to go into the details now, but just let's give some of those people listening today an insight into how many nations in a relatively short period of time when the average journey in a boat was sort of three to six months and half the boats didn't make it, uh, you know, with the storms and the irregularities of the ocean currents, uh, where did these missionaries go within 10, 20, 30 years? What nations of the world were they in? It's an amazing uh, story to see the impact of missions that these Moravian believers had. Uh, and again, because of uh, them, uh, their heart for the Lamb, that, that those that have never heard before would have an opportunity to hear the gospel, I think is such a, an important uh, factor, you know, when we think about this uh, going into it. So, uh, <clears throat> I, I mean, where these uh, missionaries were sent first started uh, uh, over in the West Indies. And the first, very first two missionaries were uh, sailed across the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, were, were, and were, I mean, the Atlantic Ocean, and landed in this area called the West Indies, the, the Caribbean. And really a phenomenal story of how um, I think the gospel first began to spread into these islands. And it was really working together with these slaves. Uh, many of them slaves, and they were even willing, it says, to sell themselves into slavery to reach the slaves with the gospel. I mean, what a profound uh, heart commitment. We read about this in some of their, their journals where they were saying, I'm willing to become a slave in order to reach these slaves with the gospel. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on that work as, as you hear that kind of language? I mean, that, that is just, to me, one of the greatest, um, uh, you know, being willing to literally sell yourself to become a slave in order to reach the slaves with the gospel. So well, powerful. you know, what you've got to understand, Jason, and many of our listeners don't, I think you and I have some sort of grasp of this, but, you know, we, we're not, you can't, we're not talking about the culture of the 21st century. We're talking about the 1700s when slaves were expendable and everybody believed i mean but everybody except very some very devout christians who thought this is wrong we have to stand against it unfortunately many christians actually believed the slave trade was a necessary evil but the great mass of the population thought that slaves were um, a total reality uh, a total need and you can't do without slaves they had slaves even in england uh, they had slaves right through the continent and most of these slaves were black. Some of them were white, mm -hmm. but most of them were black. And they regarded the black man as an inferior race mm -hmm. and therefore his worth, the worth of his life was, was, was not something considered um, the same, was it? Right. So for these guys... For these guys to say, we will go and sell it, we're prepared to go and sell ourselves into slavery, we're prepared to become slaves, to reach the slaves, was just mind-boggling just in itself, mm -hmm. without even the fact that they were prepared to sell themselves into slaves, just to go and reach the slaves, would be a cultural, like, oh, you can't do that, that's stupid, don't even think about that. 
So they were going against the culture like in an extreme way for the cross and for Jesus, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's fantastic. It's, it's just amazing, uh, this commitment that they had that, that, that I think we need to learn from today. Amen? Yeah. I mean, so when Leonard Dober and David Nietzsche set out to take the gospel to the islands, these West Indies, this was 1732, uh, William Carey, the father of Protestant missions, uh, had, hadn't even been born yet. Uh, Hudson Taylor, missionary pioneer, he wouldn't arrive in China for another 150 years. And so Dober and Nietzsche were the first missionaries sent out by the Moravian brethren. And I mean, really within, let's say, 20 years, Moravian missionaries were now in the Arctic. Uh, they were among the Eskimos. Uh, they were in southern Africa, uh, among the Indians in North America, Suriname, China, India, Persia. And by the time other Christian missionaries had arrived, I mean, 50 years later, the Moravians had already baptized 13,000 converts. <laughs> they had planted churches on the islands of St. Thomas, St. Croix, uh, Jamaica, Antigua. The West Indies. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's phenomenal. Uh, these these Moravians were the first Protestants to treat world missions as the responsibility of the whole church. And so under Zinzendorf, the Moravians became an intense and this, this really a mobile missionary movement. I would say within two decades, the Moravians had sent out more missionaries than all Protestants had sent out in the previous couple hundred years. <laughs> I mean, this is like rapid deployment. It's a lot of these young years. Years as well. It could, could, could quite possibly that the Moravians in 20, 30 years, uh, from my reading of church history, Jason, have sent out more missionaries uh, in 20, 30 years than the previous thousand years. Yeah. Now, you know, we've got to be honest, we don't know uh, all of history, um, but just trying to piece together through the, through the sort of the, the, the dark ages and so on, yeah. um, it's just an extraordinary, extraordinary activity, yeah. and that they are so little known is also extraordinary. We, let's let's talk about the uh, the hidden seed. What's this hidden seed? This this phrase because it it's been used actually uh, by by Zinzendorf himself, and it seems to go right back uh, hundreds of years. Correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can give just a little bit of the history. Um, Let's start here. I, I see the, the renewed uh, Moravian church, right, dating from 1722, really is the product of uh, three factors, three converging factors at this time. Uh, the first was a religious revival in Germany, and it was called Pietism. And this movement brought about a Christ-centered awakening of what might have seemed like a lifeless church. Uh, the second was the pressure of religious persecution and uh, increasing... When did pietism start? When did pietism start, roughly? The late 1600s, wasn't it? Yeah, this early 1600s, yeah. yeah. Early 1600s. Mm -hmm. um, a second factor here was this pressure of religious persecution and, and also this increasing division uh, amongst God's people. And I think third, the personality and anointing of, of this man named Count Zinzendorf that, that we'll get into later. But those three factors converged in, uh, in this time frame. And the new churches that were arising out of the Reformation had done so much to improve the religious life of Europe. But in the aftermath, there was still this dissension, uh, especially surrounding organizational structures of the church. Okay, So... Uh, <clears throat> Not only did they have these, these different tensions continue between Catholics and Protestants, but also now among the four major Protestant divisions of Lutherans, uh, Reformers, the Anabaptists, and the Anglicans. And uh, this, this created this climate and environment of, of division. Uh, although Luther's conviction and attempt at promoting the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers, right? The Lutherans of the day were still heavily influenced by the state and the church leadership. And so the majority of the body were still 
passive listeners. Um, you think about the sacraments had become so liturgical, uh, form formalities almost without power. Uh, you think about the 30 years war that brought this massive devastation to the cross of Christ in, in, the, in the 1600s. But in the midst of this environment, there was this revival that burst forth. And again, as it came forth in this form of pietism. I would say probably beginning about 1670. And it was under the leadership, pastoral leadership, of Philip Jacob Spinner. And he introduced what were called these small home meetings. We would call them small groups today or, or cell groups today. But this helped to recover the personal, the experiential relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, recover the inward life of the spirit that, of course, Luther had known personally. Uh, two, there was two theological uh, centers for training that had emerged in Germany. The first course was in Wittenberg, the center of orthodoxy. And the second was in a place called Hau, the center of pietism. And Zinzendorf was a child of pietism and yet was a bridge between both solid doctrine, Lutheran doctrine, and orthodox truth, and this new movement called pietism. So, so it really, Zinzendorf was a true forerunner. And he was calling the church back to personal and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ in and with the power of the Holy Spirit. And throughout the, whole, throughout the history of the church, I mean, it's always been these, you know, we know these, these ardent lovers of Jesus who have felt the greatest need for more of God's presence in their lives. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of, the class of saints that Zinzendorf belongs to, right? For Zinzendorf, gospel-centered, loving fellowship with Jesus was the essential manifestation of the Christian life. And he had chosen, right, from an early age as his life motto, the now famous confession, I have one passion, it is Jesus, Jesus only. And now let's go back just a little bit further and, and we'll get into the hidden seed. Uh, the Moravian movement, I think, uh, began with a man by the name of J John Huss. Uh, he was a spiritual father of the Moravian movement. And he's considered by many historians to have, have really been the first true reformer of the church, preceding Martin Luther by a hundred years, by a century. Uh, around 60, I mean, uh, 1369, there was this goose who was born in Gooseland. And John Huss, Huss is Czech for goose, was born in Husinek, which is Czech for goose town in the kingdom of uh, Bohemia. John Huss was a priest, he was a pastor, he was a professor, he was a philosopher, but his greatest impact was, I think, was as a teacher. He wrote a bit. He wrote and books, a, didn't he? Uh, yeah, incredible writer. Yeah, he was a teacher, he's an author, he, he had devoted himself to biblical truth. And Huss's preaching and teaching, the impact in those days. I mean, this was before the invention of the printing press. I mean, it really was an unrival. I mean, with the possible exception, maybe, of John Wycliffe. But virtually all the reformers followed Huss. Uh, you know, acknowledged him as their inspiration. In essence, his message was about getting the word of God into the hands of the common people. Right? He believed in the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. And, of course, the precious truths of, of the doctrines of grace. Right? Amen. That we are saved by grace alone, uh, through faith alone, in Christ alone, based on the word of God alone, and all for the glory of God alone. So this is like about 120, 130 years before um, Luther, correct? Martin Luther. Yeah. So this would have been, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, kind of mid-1300s when he was born, but then it would have been about 1402. Huss becomes the rector of the University of Prague. And that, of course, was one of the, the foremost institutions of higher learning in the world at that time. That same year, the newly built Bethlehem Chapel appointed him as their preacher, famous church in Czech. And from this pulpit, Huss began to demand the reformation of the church. I mean, he preached a radical biblical vision of what the church was supposed to be. 
And though the Roman Catholic Church, of course, had banned the writings of John Wycliffe, Huss was teaching from them and translated them into the Czech language. Uh, so Huss just, defended just, his works. This, thing, this is important, um, uh, Jason. So what you're saying is that Wycliffe was an inspiration for Huss, correct? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, some people call Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation, <laughs> where John Huss was like the forerunner of the Reformation. So it's just beginning to dawn with Wycliffe. He translate Huss translates Wycliffe's, uh, you know, the scriptures into the Czech language, so the people could hear and hear preaching of the Word of God in their heart language and understand it. People might not understand here, um, Jason. We have to make this clear that most people. Most preaching was in Latin. Most liturgical Correct. services was in, were in Latin. They weren't preaching the Bible. They weren't teaching the Bible in the common language, the, the language La Franca of you know the English language, for instance, or the Czech language, or the German language. It was yeah. basically Latin because they felt that Latin was a holy language in verdict commas, um, mm -hmm. and so these guys were radical to actually even translate the Bible into their own language. They were actually sort of, you know, quite countercultural and quite, that would be regarded as quite, um, you know, bohemian, quite literally, you know, the bohemian sort of idea that someone's a bohemian, if they're, um, if they're different, well, these guys were the super bohemians, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and not, and not only, you know, getting the scriptures back into the heart language of the people, but he also argued against indulgences. Uh, he advocated for both the bread and the wine to be served in communion. I mean, at this time, the Roman church wasn't offering the cup to the people anymore, which is just astounding to me. Um, but, uh, and, he, and, and Huss would also preach in the common language, right? There's he, one other thing, Jason, there's one other thing we've got to sort of, for people to understand. Um, the we, we live in a time when the, the Catholic Church is, is quite reformed and quite, I believe, quite you know, progressive in the sense of engagement with scriptures, progressive in the sense of engagement with the Holy Spirit, progressive in the sense of, uh, you know, being quite biblical in a, in, a, in a broad sense, right? In a broad sense, yes, we, mm -hmm. as Protestants, sometimes we'd have our differences of opinion. But back in those days, uh, not all the popes, but many of the popes were very corrupt. There's incredible corruption within the Catholic Church, and and uh, you know nepotism, and uh, you know the popes would actually, you know, uh, there would be three or four popes fighting wars with other popes in Italy, and crazy stuff going on in church. Terrible immorality at very high levels. Um, I mean, gross immorality. So these guys were arguing for the reform of the church, yeah. which which needed reform desperately, correct? Oh, for Jason? sure. Yeah. I mean, you think about the, they're, they're, they were confronting the moral, I mean, really the moral debauchery of the priests, bishops, the cardinals, even the Pope. Uh, Huss uh, came against the selling of indulgences, right? The selling of the, the grace of God, you might say, including deliverance from purgatory for money. It was a perversion of faith. It was an insult to God. I mean, he went so far as to declare that the Pope may not even be a true Christian unless he complied with the biblical definition of faith. In this day, this is radical. <laughs> but uh, Huss's message became extremely popular and spread into the surrounding countries of Poland and Hungary, Austria, Croatia. Uh, but there was this growing schism between those demanding reformation and the church authorities. Right, the church was demanding that Huss appear then before the Council of Constance. And because his intent, really Huss's intent, which is noble, was to reform the church, not divide it, he agreed yeah. to, to, to attend this council. And the king at that time guaranteed safe passage and returned to and from the council. But it was at the council in 1514 that Huss was declared a heretic and he was burned at the stake. Right, the price for at this at this time in this day the price for challenging the Roman Church. Um, there's an amazing story actually with this. I'll just share it real quick. Uh, before the flames took his life, Huss actually prophesied that the message of liberty and spiritual reform 
would not die. And instead, it would be a hidden seed falling into the ground and dying for a season, but one day sprouting and bearing much fruit. Uh, church officials were uh, convinced that Huss's message would die with him. But of course, we know this to their dismay. His heroic death only fanned the flame, you might say, of his message right, that he had ignited. And so we know that truth is more powerful than death. And persecution only scatters the seeds of truth. Huss's courage, his resolve, it's astounding to die rather than compromise his convictions, inspired countless others to follow uh, in his footsteps, and including martyrs after him. As Huss prophesied, this seed sprouted again, and it's still bearing more fruit than he probably could have ever dreamed of. Right? This seed was carried into the hearts of great saints who washed over it until the right time. Uh, <clears throat> One of those who followed in Huss's spiritual lineage was John Amos Comenius, who became the inspiration of, of Count Zinzendorf. And uh, Comenius was called the father of modern uh, Christian education. And uh, <clears throat> so it was, it, was, it was even this, that it was the power and clarity of Huss's message and his, his uncompromising a devotion to the scriptures as the true source of doctrine that really changed the world. Um, you know, one other just amazing uh, fact that happened at Huss's death, I mean, just prior to him being burned at the stake, Huss was asked to recount his teachings and, and uh, Huss's response, I mean, it's just, was this, I'll just, I'll just read this, it says, when the chain was put about him at the stake, he said with a smiling countenance, my Lord Jesus Christ was bound with a harder chain than this for my sake. And why then should I be ashamed of this rusty chain? No, said Huss, I never preached any doctrine of any evil tendency. And what I taught with my lips, I now seal with my blood. <laughs> oh. And he said to the executioner, and here's another prophetic word. He says, you are now going to burn a goose. Hus uh, signified goose, right, in the Bohemian language. But in a century, you will have a swan which you can neither roast nor boil. And as the flames right, climbed higher, he sang, and it was reported that people could hear his song through the crackling of the fire. I mean, fantastic story. After his death, outrage fills Bohemia, and in his name, followers revolted against Rome in the massive protests that lasted for over a decade. I mean, the geese were not silent, you might say. <laughs> uh, it's interesting, too, that the evening before October 31st, 1517, the uh, elector, Frederick of Saxony, he has a dream which was recorded by his brother, Duke John. And in the dream, in short, it's about a monk who wrote on the church door of Wittenberg with a pen so large that it reached all the way to Rome. And the more those in authority tried to break the pen, the stronger it became. And when asked how the pen got so strong, this monk, right, Martin Luther, replied, the pen belonged to an old goose of Bohemia, a hundred years old. <laughs> Isn't that a great story? The selector was unsure exactly what the dream meant, but believed he had an interpretation which he thought may be accurate. In the very morning he shared his dream, Martin Luther was posting his 95 thesis on the wooden bird. So, so this guy had the dream uh, even before uh, Martin Luther put this uh, thesis uh, on the church door, nailed it to the church door, correct? Yep, correct, yep. Uh, just a bit of trivia for those who don't understand. Apparently, the, ch the idea of putting something on the church door was... The, the church door was like the town notice board. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't just for the church, but it was, it was used for many different purposes. And these were notices that were often put up there. And if there was a public proclamation or there was a change of the law, or if there was, you know, a sermon to be, to be given out, it was put on the church door and so yeah. 
the idea of Luther nailing his sermon to the church door was was literally something that people it's like putting a sermon up on YouTube today or yeah. you know uh, putting having a blog or it, getting something put in a newspaper it was that equivalent wasn't it uh, yeah. Jason correct yeah. Yeah. keep going interrupted you sorry so it's you know just imagine with me so you're Huss has this moment prophesies right a hundred years later there's this hidden seed there would be this goose uh, you know and it would be himself would come be burned to the stake but a swan would arise that could never be roasted or or boiled and so almost exactly a hundred years later after Huss is being burned at the stake October 31st 1517 Martin Luther posts his 95 thesis on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg and you know it's after the death of Luther the great reformer was frequently portrayed with a swan in Lutheran art uh, that's why you see swans everywhere and this is why Lutheran press bears the swan logo and proudly continues to trumpet the swan it's fantastic so maybe just fast forward now another hundred years in 1628 uh, John Amos Comenius uh, he was born 1592 dies 1670 He's the last bishop of the United Brethren in Moravia, now modern-day Czech Republic. And he was considered to be the father of modern Christian education. And he was leading a small band of exiled believers over the border to Poland. And they were escaping persecution in their homeland. And their community of faith seemed to be slowly dying out. And so as Comenia stood at the border, he raised his eyes to heaven and he utters this historic prayer he prays that god would preserve a remnant a hidden seed again he calls it a hidden seed which would one day spring up and grow into a great tree for the glory of god so this hidden seed indeed springs up uh, 50 years after Comenius's death when this remnant from the United Brethren crossed the border into Germany, 1722, and establishes the Moravian community of Herrenhut. So under the leadership of Count Zinzendorf, what uh, that community became and what it carried continues to affect the prayer and the missions and the discipleship movements around the world today. I mean, out of that one prayer of John Comenius, came this massive multiplication of blessing but you have equally have to argue out of the very blood of that was of um, our dear brother john huss came yeah. john Cominius came yeah. then a hundred years later came uh you know christian david and zinzendorf just to, just to share with people that community that grew up this was a time of incredible religious persecution there was incredible conflict as you say in Europe uh, people were getting killed for no reason and Christians were killing Christians and just crazy stuff was going on um, who were some of the groups that gathered there was a very eclectic uh, uh, you know the, the people that gathered at that particular uh, around that settlement in 1727 that, that David you know, knocked down the first tree on the 17th of June, uh, 1727, or 1722, get it right, Warwick, 1722, um, there was incredible, the, the, the disparity of those groups was amazing. You want to just go through some of the groups that actually made up that Moravian settlement? Mm. Yeah, well, primarily it was a group of uh, Bohemian Moravians. They were fleeing persecution. Uh, from the Roman Church that came to the area, uh, many of them risking their lives to get there. Uh, these would have been primarily descendants of the Waldensians. Um, just real quick, Waldensians, their, their motto was the simple life, uh, the Bible in their own mother tongue as their highest authority, no swearing allegiance to the king or the state, and uh, what else? Uh, oh, and uh, bread and wine for the Lord's Supper was really key. And uh, this is the group that Christian David represented. Um, uh, Christian David was a carpenter 
and he was called the Moravian Moses because he was escorting families back and forth from Moravia to Herrenhut. He actually did this 10 times, bringing groups of families uh, from uh, Moravia. And again, that would have been modern day Czech Republic primarily. Jason, if I understand correctly, uh, you know, by the grace of God, his life was preserved, but some of those people who went back to yeah. rescue people were killed, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a few of them, you know, just even starvation, uh, being sick. I mean, just all the things that happen when you're uh, a people fleeing as, as refugees, in a sense. The, um, uh, the well, tell us about the well. Yeah, so uh, when they first arrived in Bertelsdorf, that's uh, where Zinzendorf lived, uh, just, it's just a mile or so from Herrenhut, they discovered that Zinzendorf was out of town. And so they decided to meet first with the manager of Zinzendorf's estate. He was a man by the name of Heitz. Heitz was a godly man, like Zinzendorf, a businessman. And he gave these uh, persecuted refugees a place on the land. And so these Moravian refugees prayed for a place to dig a well on the land. They needed water if they're going to have this new community. And so in faith, they asked the Lord, where should we do this? And God spoke to them to begin to dig in this one particular area. And so for several days, many of the neighbors from the surrounding area mocked them. Uh, but God has spoke and they believed and they finally struck water after a few days. And I think it's just so interesting that they've now discovered many freshwater springs and wells on the land in Hernut and in that surrounding area. As early as 1699, a well was discovered by those prior to the Moravian settlers in Hernut. And uh, this well was actually uh, referred to Isaac Brunin, meaning the well of Isaac is what they had called it. And later it was renamed Zinzendorf Frua, meaning Zinzendorf's rest. Zinzendorf would often come to this well, and it was a place for him to rest, spend time with Jesus. And he actually wrote many of his hymns. He composed his hymns at this well. And I just think, uh, you know, it's a picture to me in the natural that we need to pray that God would open these ancient wells in our day of Moravian prayer and mission and revival, all for the glory of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, you know, talking about division in the camp, I don't think you finished elucidating, but if I understand correctly, yes, the, the, the majority would have come from uh, Moravia, which is um, now Czechoslovakia, uh, into into this area in Hernut, which is basically East Germany. And I've been there myself and, and, and it's a beautiful little town, still a beautiful small town actually. But there was also Catholics, uh, Catholic groups mm. uh, who were sort of, if you like, re, you know, almost like charismatic slash renewal type Catholics, you could argue. Uh, there was Anabaptists, yeah, if I understand correctly. Uh, there would have been Huguenots, yeah. I, I would imagine from France um, mm -hmm. and possibly people from other denominations as well. Uh, and so there was actually a lot of different, even though there was a common love for Jesus, there was enormous differences uh, theologically. Tell us about what happened with the divisions in the camp. Yeah, I mean, this, this combination of, you've got cultural differences, um, you know, language barrier differences. Language. In terms of races, yeah, language, correct. Um, and, and then also you've got a real eclectic, you know, theological differences. <laughs> and they're all now trying to learn how to live together. Uh, <laughs> I'm so thankful when I think about Christian David, you know, dedicating the land to be a dwelling place for the Lord, right, from that Psalm 84. Um, and, and indeed they did become that. But it took them a while to get to that place. In fact, it was a good five years of contention, um, of even some false teaching that had seeped in. 
uh, it was difficult for them to learn how to worship together, learn how to live together, do family together, even build a small community together. Um, you think back to Heights again, Zinzendorf's manager, uh, he was writing a letter to Zinzendorf, and he, he gave the name of this place Herrenhut. That's what they called it. And the name Herrenhut had a double meaning. At first, it would be a place under the Lord's watchful care, a place of refuge under the canopy of the Lord's presence. And secondly, it would be a place where the Moravians would keep watch before the Lord in prayer and intercession. Uh, one of the key verses for Zinzendorf was Isaiah 62, verse 6. It says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. Give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it a praise on the earth. Um, and, uh, you know, when Zinzendorf and Chrissy had returned home, they were there dedicating this small community. And uh, Zinzendorf sees this light up on the hill and he falls to his knees. And, and then Zinzendorf as well dedicates this little community to the Lord. So, so this community was, was founded in a place of consecration and commitment to the Lord based on the word of God. And I think it's because of this, God sees their hearts and, um, and answers that. But in the midst of that, the small community we know struggles many ways. I mean, they were experiencing dissension. Uh, they had bitterness. They had judgment against one another. Um, in incredible, uh, uh, you know, like the opposite of what you would see to be the vision of what they started in the dedication moments. Uh, they are now experiencing this uh, in real time and trying to learn how to live together. Well, you know something, uh, we're going to leave it right there. Uh, so you'll have to come and join us at the next podcast to find out what happened next. Is that right, Jason? Because God Correct. intervened when man responded to the Spirit's prompting, God intervened. And from that intervention, a miracle occurred. So thank you so much. Great talking to you, Jason. And we're looking forward to... Uh, being together in the next session, section two of this podcast, the Moravians, a hundred year prayer meeting that changed the world. God bless you. Good to be with you.